I'm starting to feel like the the parent who tells the kids Santa Claus doesn't exist. <laughs> but Santa Claus does exist. It's just that you have to look. He's not the guy. He's not the guy who comes down the chimney. He's actually your, your parents. Yeah. But it's, that's what this is really about. Because I was just thinking about that when it was over. The first section, I was thinking. I hope people don't think that I don't. That there's no such thing as love and romance. There absolutely is. But we just like everything else in this life. Do you understand the word discretion? I don't know if you have it. To, we have to be discreet, discreet about it. We have to make sure it's the right stuff, and we don't make a mistake that can be a catastrophic disaster in our lives. That's really what it's about. So I'm not here to say that Santa Claus doesn't exist. I'm here to say that he does exist, but there's only, there's not Santa Claus is everywhere. That's really the way to look at it. I don't want to move this on the North Pole. <laughs> <laughs> now we're into the dark stuff. Okay, now I'm going to just put this, this is, this is like, this is like not super dark, but it's like, this is like the minefield, okay? Co-dependency. I don't know if you know that term here in Norway, but it's one, oh God, it, it's, there's one word in your life you have to become very aware of. It's codependency, dependent on something that stops you from being yourself. Bad, bad, bad news. Now, I don't know if you saw that film here. There was a film with Tom Cruise called Jerry Maguire, about 10, 15, 12 years ago. I don't know what it was. And there's a famous scene in the film at the end of he's done all this womanizing and he's had all the great time. And he, the girl that he, he didn't really, you know, the girl at the end, the, the true love, how he expresses his true love to her is he says, you complete me, you complete me. And that's the, then the swirling music comes in the film and she goes, you know, you're supposed to cry and get all emotional and it's supposed to be a wonderful romantic scene. If, she, if I was her, I would have ran a mile. Because if you complete another person, if someone says to you, you complete me, meaning you complete me, they're saying to you one of two things. One, they're broken and damaged people and your job is not to fix them. Or two, they're putting a guilt trip on you by making you feel sorry for them. So you do take care of them. I'm helpless. That's the big one a lot of psychopaths play. I'm such a helpless little boy. I'm, I need help. I need this woman to take care of me. And it's a trap to get a free life. To get a free life to be manipulated and used. Codependency is also works on other ways too. There's some decent people, good people who are codependent because of factors in their life has made them that way. They have never developed this self, the this, this sense of self or the sense of self-esteem to be independent and stand upon their own. So they always feel they need someone to be a big daddy for them or a big mommy for them. So they're codependent on another human being. But this can extend to being codependent on the government, codependent on corporations. That I cannot function as a human being unless there's somebody telling me what to do. So codependence is a very bad thing because it makes you, what, when you say when you're codependent or when you become codependent, what you're really saying is, I cannot survive on my own because I don't want to or I don't know how to. And that's really not a good way for a human being to live because if, if, you're, if you're codependent on another human being, say in a relationship and that person leaves you or dies or something, well, you, you kind of die too. And that's not right, because you should be able to survive, because that's, no, you know, that's because you, you become almost addicted to that person. You're codependent on them. It's not healthy. Now you can be, your children, are like the unconditional love, they are definitely codependent on their parents because they needed to survive. When I'm talking about these terms and this, this talk tonight, I'm talking about grown adults, anyone over the age of like 18 or 19. That's on their own in the world. That's what I'm really talking about. There's no need for a human being to be codependent unless they're disabled or handicapped. A normal, healthy person should be dependent. 
we've lost so much of this. We've become so codependent on everything. And I often do believe that this idea of codependency in relationships, in romantic relationships, is probably what is a way that we've actually become codependent across society. You know, a lot of people go into marriage because they think they have to. Would they be happier if they never got married? To some people who are single all their lives and they never get married and they're happy. And then there's other people who want to get married and they ask them why? Well, everyone's getting married. I mean, I have friends in Ireland and, you know, they would date for four or five years and they weren't particularly in love or anything. They're more like a socializing friendship. And then they say, we're getting married next year. That's ah, long enough. That's just fulfilling a script. And remember, there's a lot of ramifications to marrying someone that goes that lasts forever, really, in many ways. And codependency is deliberately created by the system because they want you to be codependent upon other people. They want you to get married. Governments love that because it means that they got to, they, you know, they get the money for the the marriage license and everything else. They can change, They have the. It's better for the government taxation wise and everything to have people codependent. I, I, I'm actually, I believe in marriage, I think it's a wonderful thing, but it's not for everyone. And some people who don't want to get married shouldn't get married, they shouldn't get married. And that's okay, but we live in a society where people are kind of like guilted into it, like especially women, you know, all her friends are getting married and having babies, she's kind of got a social pressure to do that too as well. Same with a guy, he doesn't want to be the last one left alone. All his friends have all gotten married and he has no one to socialize with anymore, so he has to get married. The whole situation is geared towards that. It's geared towards a kind of a codependency. And quite a large number of people who enter into marriages, enter into relationships, do it because they're fulfilling a social obligation. They're not doing it because they really feel it's right for them. And I find that very strange because I wouldn't want to live my, live my life that way. And yeah, I know a lot of people who do. They just get married for the sake of it. I mean, I would actually say that most of the married couples I know, there's just no reason for them to be together. And they'll often do things crazy, like to try and make this, re this relationship work, they'll have a child. But that's blackmailing yourself. That's blackmailing yourself. I know we'll have another baby. That way we won't hate each other. You know, that's how people think. It's almost like they, they're, they're buying time, they're buying insurance, they're buying themselves. Blackmail, blackmail, blackmail yourself. Codependency to make it work instead of just walking away. Instead of just walking away. And I think that's a good thing in all your life. If you have a job, you know, like you think about it, people who work in jobs they hate, but they think I can't leave this job, I have to keep at this job. But you have a codependency with the job that's not healthy either. I, the, the thing is to go look for another job. Don't stay there. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a good job. It's a government job. Or it pays well. Or I won't get a job as good as it. Says who? Says who? But you're not, you, you think you're going to be happy in that job? You think, you, think you're, you, think by, you think by dealing with your boss who's abusive that it's going to get better one day? It's not. It's only going to get worse and your soul will be destroyed if you stay there. You live and you get another job. That's how codependency is engineered through everywhere. You can't leave your job, it's a good job. Sure you can, Why another one. You do lots of things. I, and co codependency can be very dark, like I said, in a relationship where someone guilts a person into staying with them. They play on them pity. And that was another thing of you complete me, meaning I'm a failure and now your job is to make me less of a failure by taking care of me because I can't take care of myself. And that's making you a slave. And people have to remember that, that you have, no one has the right to make a slave of you, not another person in a relationship, not a corporation or not a government. You're a sovereign, free, independent soul. And that's what you should always think of yourself as. At that level, you're free and you're, you're, you're independent and you're soul. And on top of that, it's parts of your ego and your neurology and your biology that's been targeted to make you codependent. Now, I was reading an awful lot on codependency. There's, it happens to a lot of decent, good people as well, where they need codependency. And it's actually quite sad. 
because the problem has not been addressed at the earliest stage. Many of the books I've read and the, the, the lectures I've looked at by psychiatrists and psychologists all come to the same conclusion, basically, that this need to have to have someone in your life to complete you, it comes often from, in childhood, from poor parenting or neglect. They were neglected or they were not taken care of by their parents. A good example would be a child whose parents was an, say his parent mother was an alcoholic, okay? And say he or she was the oldest child in the family. Well, what happens is they become the kind of surrogate mother or father. And the child who's the oldest one is the one who starts taking care of the younger ones. <coughs> And that child has sacrificed its needs in order to try and take its own childhood and become a kind of a surrogate parent at an early age because the, the mother or the father is an alcoholic. Now the child may not physically, mentally know this, but will somehow instinctually know it. And the child begins taking care of their siblings, often their younger siblings, unconditionally, which is a beautiful thing when you think about it, that like a kid who's like eight or nine, would be doing things like, you know, feeding your younger brothers and sisters and stuff like that. I think that's a beautiful thing, actually. It just goes to show you how that all human beings, well, not all, not the psychopaths, but all the decent, almost human beings, and 98% of people on this earth are actually driven by kindness and decency and goodness. And they get it from a very early age. We're going to say something? Uh, one thing I found in, in therapy with most codependent uh, couples or the ones that are in codependent relationships is it when you're talking about being in a, in a poor in a poor childhood, they haven't learned how to play. Yeah. They have never been able to have the freedom to play without being responsible for something. Mm -hmm. So they can't take play in their grown-up life. It's work, 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 serve, 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 serve. And that includes their relationships mm. more than anything else. And they don't see a relationship as a coming together. They see it as a taking care of someone else. And that's, that's because they were taking care of their younger brothers and sisters when they were younger because mommy was drunk all the time or she was just not a good parent. She didn't have to take care of a child. Daddy was a drug addict or he wasn't home. The old, that's a good one too. That can even happen in a family that's not on the surface uh, dysfunctional. So for say for instance, say a man who's a good, a good, a good man, right? And he, he, he thinks he's doing the right thing by his family by working all, all the time. So he's never at home, right? He's not abusing the children in any physical way. In fact, he thinks he's doing the opposite. He's trying to give them everything by working constantly. And the kids never see him. Well, that child will also, the sons and the, the, the older daughters and the older sons will grow up fulfilling the father at home, that aspect. And they become codependent as they reach adulthood as well. And codependency is a much bigger problem in this society than people know about. I'm sure you, you thousands of people have gone through your, your, your thing. It's a big deal, and we all have it on some level. But it's what happens is some people have it really, really bad. And they haven't looked, and you says, they haven't learned how to play as children, but they also haven't learned how to take care of themselves. And they also have no, they're sacrificing their needs completely. And that's not healthy either, because that makes you a self-willing a self slave. When you've got to take care of your needs too, you've got to look after your needs too. Codependent people tend to marry young. They tend to marry very early with the first person that they meet. I find that's a very common one. They fight because they just want, they just think they always have to be with somebody. They always have to be. And as I said, the society engineers codependency. Another aspect is, another kind of thing as a codependent child that causes them is the children who had an instinctual feeling they weren't wanted. Even if it was never verbalized, they know that their parents didn't really want them. Example, guy and a girl meets, say in a country town somewhere, right? She gets, they have a fling, teenage romance, whatever. The girl gets pregnant and you have like what you call, I don't know if you use the expression here in Norway, but a shotgun wedding where they're kind of forced into getting married to look after the kid. It doesn't happen so much nowadays, but in you know, previous generations. So those two people are together. Now they may never physically say to that, uh, verbally say to that child, you know, I'm having to live with her because of you. Or she never, never said, the worst thing I ever have is having you because I'm stuck with him. 
Even if they break up, you're still stuck with them. However, I can tell you that the child knows that deep down inside. Even if it's never said, and the two parents may be good people, but if the child realizes one day that the two parents are mismatched and the only thing that glues them together is the child, it, subconsciously that child will figure out, I'm the problem here, right? So when they grow up, knowing that at some level they were not wanted, and when I say wanted, I don't mean in an emotional sense, I mean not wanted in the sense that they were an inconvenience, a problem, and they, they were a problem for those two adults, that child will also grow up, can often grow up being codependent, because then they want to try and repair that situation. This will be the young girl who gets pregnant and has a baby very young, because she wants something to love, because really, really love, because she's not getting it. She never got that her as a child. Now, I grew up in a tough neighborhood in Dublin. In fact, a very tough neighborhood on the north side of Dublin, which is like basically a ghetto. It's all gone now, it was knocked down years ago. But when I was growing up there, all the, t the biggest problem was teenage girls getting pregnant at like 16 and 17. The reason for that was they didn't have any fathers. They did not get that love. So the mother would often, the mother would be sort of like an uneducated girl who would have babies, three or four babies, by different, felt different guys that she would know. So they were never home, the mother was raised alone, and the government took care of all their needs, welfare, housing, healthcare, education, all paid for by the government. So daddy was the government, okay? But there was no physical daddy at home. And the child, in some of those cases, and I don't care what anyone says, people have called, said that I've been classist for saying this or it's not, but I'm from that background, so I'm telling it as it is. Some of these women, some of these young girls would get bigger welfare payments for each child. And after like two kids, the welfare payment would shoot up. I mean, a lot of money, you know, that kind of thing. And they would get a free housing and you'd get a better house and all the utilities would be paid for. Well, some girls used to manipulate the system and they would have another two kids for that reason. To get into a nicer house, nicer apartment, better, you know, better, a bigger check from the government each month and that kind of thing. So that, those children would grow up only associating parenting with, with screwing the system, with getting back at the government, with getting money. And so those children would not know love either. They would see themselves only as a unit. And they would crave love because they'd want to know if they were brought, every, ch every child wants to know that their parents had them because they loved them. It's an instinctual need many children have. Those children would grow codependent, and those girls would do the same thing. They'd all, they would often get pregnant, and they, but they wouldn't be milking the system. They wouldn't be like trying to get more government money. They were just desperately looking for real love. And the first like, opportunist teenage boy full of hormones would come along, take advantage of her need for love. She's pregnant, but she didn't care because of the baby. This, and you know, this is a big problem that it's, 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 it's stopped a lot now. They've had a lot of good work with psychologists and stuff like that dealing with it. But, uh, and also contraception is, is better used now. But that was a huge problem. They needed love so bad. And so you'd have this intergenerational codependency. Very bad news, very bad stuff. And so it's, it's, it was a poison that would run through society. And then that film, Jerry Maguire, with, with, with what's his name, uh, that, uh, Tom Cruise, that line when he said, you complete me, and it was supposed to be this wonderful statement of love. It wasn't, it's a horrific statement of slavery. And yet, I, I posted on my Facebook wall two weeks ago about that scene, and I said, that, w that was the worst scene in history because, you know, it just sh it showed that this was like this guy was only using her as an object. He needed to fulfill a need inside himself, and it wasn't really love. Now I'd say seventy five percent of the women agreed with me, and they would never marry a guy that would say you complete me. But about twenty five percent said it was the most romantic, beautiful scene. How could you say this, Thomas? It's terrible. You're spoiling the fun. I didn't say anything, I don't, didn't judge anybody, but it just goes to show you the power, the power of this kind of Hollywood romance thing all over people. Now another one, fellas, men are bad too in their own way. If you look on YouTube, especially in America, it's, all, it's actually it's nearly all in America, there's so many videos of fellas who, during sports games, bring the girl into the middle of the stadium, 
and propose to the girl in front of the packed stadium. It's a big thing in America. It's supposed to mean, I really care, I really care. He gets down on his knees in the audience, the crowd ah, cheering. How can she say no? <laughs> it's blackmail. It's, it's blackmail. It's blackmail. It's blackmail. Well, there's a few videos where the women refuse. And the look on the guy's faces says everything. Yeah. And it's like, you, sh I, you shouldn't laugh at someone's problems, but I can't help in these cases because these, some of these guys deserved it. Because there was, there was one where the girl is dragged out to the stadium. It's like a basketball game, right? And uh, you could tell that the guy was, was like, pull, you know, he was chancing his luck here. He was, he was, he was in the casino a lot. He was, he was gambling, right? And she didn't know what was going on. She was like, what, what? So obviously she wasn't in deep in the relationship as he, as, as he wanted her to be, right? And he gets down with the ring and very nicely she just goes, oh, sorry, I can't do it, and walks away. And the crowd all go, oh, and that kind of a thing. But really, he, he deserved it. He deserved it because he was uh, using 20,000 people inside a basketball stadium to manipulate her. He was, he was attacking her in many ways. It was wrong, you shouldn't have done it. And there's other ones like that. There's one where there's one that's apt, it's like a scene from a movie, it's so bad, it goes so wrong for the guy. He gets, he, he gets the girl in a restaurant or something and his friend comes in with a guitar and they start, he, they, she start, he starts singing the song Sweet Caroline, because that was her name I guess, right? The Neil Diamond song. And he, this guy had everything plant, perfectly done and the people in the restaurant are all like, you know, the author, she's going to say yes. And she says, no, I'm sorry, I can't do it, and walks away. And the look on his face is like, it's like it's the batteries have been taken out of a robot. Because he is, he's not prepared for this, that it would happen. It's not prepared at all. And you don't like laughing at somebody. But in a case like that, you can't help it. Because it's like, you feel like saying, did you not, did you not account for this perhaps happening that she would say no and the reason why is because he didn't care what she thought he wanted to get married to her and that was the end of it so her needs were not an issue he was manipulating and using her and he only wanted to use her and what she wanted didn't matter and at some instinctual or maybe conscious level he knew that he didn't have a chance so he brought the crowd in the stadium or the other performance to try and get her through guilt to say yes and sometimes those girls do do it and then they probably hopefully the next day they wake up and say I made a mistake or they you know but what I, mean, I guarantee you that many of those 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 relationships where they 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 have that in the stadium. I, I'm sure they go wrong. That's also like the rebound. You know the rebound relationship where someone breaks up with someone and then instantly marries someone else real quickly to get back at the other person or else they feel, they just do it. The rebound relationship, they always end up in failure as well because they're not building anything real. They're infatuation, infatuate. Or they're built on needs or fixing things inside yourself or solving a problem. I have a problem, let's get married. I don't know, like that, that's literally how some people think. I've got a problem, let's get married. Like it's like I gotta get married. They don't. They don't. They, and then they don't look at the whole ramifications of that. What it means to them as people. What what it, how it affects the other human being. Now, I th I spoke about the conditional love and the unconditional love. I think unconditional love is great for children because you have to unconditionally love them because they depend on they depend on their parents to look after them. Conditional love is the right one to go with because it means look. Now, conditional love can be taken to the extreme as well, where you can say to someone, "Oh, I'll stay with you as long as you don't put on weight, or I'll stay as long I'll stay with you as long as you're still pretty, or I'll stay as long as you still have your hair." As soon as your hair is gone, I'm out. That's conditional love gone to the extreme, where it's I I love you as long as you don't change. That's 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 actually how a lot of people do think as well. Oh, he's perfect. He's amazing. As long as he doesn't lose his hair, then I've got another guy who gets, or gets fat. You know, that's another thing. Or as long as he's rich, conditional love is, as long as he's rich, or as long as she's rich or pretty. Unconditional love is the worst one in the world unless it's children. Now, a lot of this, this idea comes from the, this kind of, this uh, codependency. It's very similar to Pavlovian conditioning in many ways. I don't know if I spoke about this last time, but Pavlov, he, what he did was he discovered that uh, 
You could make a dog salivate by ringing a bell because every time <coughs> you rang the bell, the dog associated it with feeding time. So you could actually, they, they figured out earlier on through behaviorism that human be animals had certain behaviors that could be predicted according to their needs, such as food feeding time. And this is another guy called Watson, an American guy, was also heavily involved in this. And they, they discovered it, it was applicable to some degree with human beings, not completely. And they figured out that a lot of you could condition human beings to want certain things and do certain things at certain times. You could, you could, you could uh, instigate a chemical, a neurochemical flood inside the body. So for instance, when the dog associated the bell being ran with feeding time, it began to salivate. <coughs> On a different level, a human being can be made to have feelings for a person upon certain conditions. So therefore, there's people who can only love each other when they're having sex and the rest of the time hate each other. You can have people who only love each other when they're spending money and the rest of the time, if they were poor, they would hate each other. It's a similar kind of idea. A need is being fulfilled by a behaviorism. And that behaviorism is also very dangerous because it puts these people in a state of hypervigilance that it's always, they're always worried that's going to be taken away from them. So, you know, there's a relationship where... I love this person, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose him any second. I'm afraid she's gonna leave me any second. This hypervigilance kit thing kicks in. It's all so unhealthy, it's all so dangerous, and it creates these manias and these obsessions and these pains, and, and it, it leaves people wide open to be manipulated. See, this is, again, we're talking about defending your own, your own consciousness, defending your own needs and your own your own personality and standing as a sovereign being in every aspect of your life and your relationships, it should be very important in that. 